In 2011, I walked in on my best friend as he was dying, and my whole world flipped upside down. Not only was I sad and depressed, but I began to question God and why things happened the way they did. By fall 2012, I'd quit my job and I was trying to figure it out. I found myself sitting in a coffee shop with a friend who was devastated because her cousin was suddenly killed. She told me that the people of Syria began to stand together, rise, and peacefully protest for their voice and right to speak freely in their home country. She told me that her cousin was courageous enough to stand alongside his friends, peacefully protest, but hours later, his head was cut off and placed on the doorstep of his family's home. I couldn't believe this. I couldn't comprehend how something like that could be happening. But I did remember the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá when he said, the people of this world are thinking of warfare. You must be peacemakers. So I began researching, started my own personal blog, fundraised, and booked a round trip flight to Turkey. I knew I needed to tell my parents, so I called my dad to meet with him face to face. I would have never anticipated for him to say, I would do the same thing. Don't tell your mother I said that. <laughs> Weeks later, I'm sneaking into Syria, five hours by car to the middle of a war zone, with a Syrian-American friend, Nesreen, thankful for her as she spoke Arabic and I did not. And little did I know that this journey would change the whole course of my life. By the time we reached our destination, it was pitch dark. All we could hear were the sounds of missiles and bombs. The home of the stranger's house that we were led in was not a home by any means. Uh, it was a cement building not done being built, with one or two rooms with carpet and a few floor pads. I clearly remember having to squeeze past a parked car that was blocking the doorway because an electrical cord was connected to the car's engine lighting the light bulb inside the house. When I snuck inside of Syria, I had with me a backpack filled with coloring books, colored pencils, and Play-Doh. I put a pair of underwear, toothbrush, and my contacts in the pocket of my cargo pants, and I hid 12,000 US dollars on me. Let me pause here and tell you a bit about myself. My parents are Iranian-Americans. They immigrated here in the 70s when my brother was two years old. They lived in the Bronx, New York, where my sister was born, and they moved to California when they had me. My dad heard of Orange County as a better place to raise your family, so he moved us there. My parents worked very hard. I lived a comfortable and blessed life. So it's not so surprising that when I told my friends that I was sneaking inside of Syria, a war zone, a developing country, while over half the population of this country were fleeing their country, I was met with disapproval, frustration, and confusion. Questions like, why would you put yourself in harm's way? What if you die? What difference could you make anyway? Amidst lack of support, I remembered again the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá when he said, Be as a lamp unto them that walk in darkness, a joy to the sorrowful, a sea for the thirsty, a haven for the distressed, an upholder and defender of the victim of oppression. Now back to March 2013, I've snuck five hours in the middle of a war zone, I'm in Syria, I'm in a stranger's home, and I don't speak a word of Arabic. Not to mention, the sounds of bombs and missiles are still going on around me. I sit back to take in my environment, and I hear the sounds of little footsteps outside the door. So I pull out the goodies in my backpack, and I begin coloring myself. 
and the children actually trickle in. They're beautiful and happy. And just when I'm beginning to finally feel calm and no longer cognizant of the sounds of missiles and bombs, I notice the whole room's gone quiet. And one particular man, Ziad, is asking me what I'm doing there, to which I quickly reply, I heard people were suffering, so I came to help. And he looked at me, conflicted, and said, but you are not Syrian. Are you Muslim? No, I'm not. So he asked again, are you a photographer or a journalist? No, I'm not. And he looked quite perplexed. So I put my hand on my heart and I said, if this was happening to my family in my home in the city that I lived in, I hope to God, Allah, which was the only word I, in Arabic that I knew at the time, that someone from across the world would show up. So that's why I came. <laughs> By the following morning, we'd exchanged US dollars to Syrian pounds, bought food in bulk, handmade food bags, and distributed to people living in parking lot-sized dirt holes. Parking lot-sized dirt holes. Families of eight to 15, living without electricity, running water, nothing. Nasreen and I split up one time. She went to go distribute food bags. I stayed back to continue bagging food. And although I was used to the bombs and missiles at this point, the men in the room began suddenly yelling, yalla, yalla, hurry, hurry, as they escorted me out. No one should see what I saw at this moment in my life. It was disarray, blood, people were running around, cars were getting people to places as they were pulling me to an underground room where all the women and children of this village were, all of which were crying and I couldn't communicate to anyone. So I just waited. A couple minutes felt like hours. And then I heard Nestrine show up with the other group calling my name, Pune, Pune. So I went out to meet her and she's like, I thought you were dead, I thought you were dead. And I said, Nesreen, we have to leave. That happened because they know we're here, we have to go. Hours later, we were taken to the border. I crossed, and a week later, I'm back home. But I knew something needed to be done on a larger scale. So I started For the Unseen, a 501c3 nonprofit focused on creating sustainable solutions to alleviate human suffering and to spread the message of one human race. I went back to Syria doing immediate aid work three more times that year, but it wasn't sustainable. I heard of Mustafa, a Syrian refugee living in Tripoli, Lebanon, and together we started a school called Birds of Hope. Classes are taught grades one through nine for the children. They're all Syrian refugees. Subjects such as math, Arabic, art, physical education, science. The mission of this school is to teach every student that even though they've endured psychological trauma, that they can be agents of change for something better and more positive. Originally, we had enrolled 350 students, and to date, we have nearly 3,000. You may remember me after today, or you may forget me. You may take something from what I've shared, or you may not. But I do ask this, to ask yourselves privately, how do you live your life day to day? Do you live it with peace and unconditional love? Do you live it in doing an act of service for another, especially a stranger? To those of you that speak English in this room, you can teach English via Skype to a Syrian refugee and give them a future. You can donate your time to a local organization. The resources are endless. I encourage you to live with your hearts open, to respond with love, and to actively make a difference. Because you can and anyone can. Thank you.